uh, a Pentecostal distinctive. And you can go ahead and put that on there for me, Jenny. Tongues. We brought that up yesterday. And I think I, 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 not I think, I know. I drilled down pretty hard on that to prove once and for all that number one, tongues has not died out and did not die out with the apostles. And not only tongues, but all the gifts of the Spirit. And we went through all of that. Remember, I gave you a list of the gifts of the Spirit. And I said, isn't it kind of ridiculous that you just pick and choose what particular uh, spiritual gift you want to say doesn't exist anymore and which ones you want to arbitrarily say does exist. And so we just went through that. And I proved to you out of the Scriptures, Acts 2.39, that these promises, the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's not only for that generation, but Peter's crystal clear on that sermon on Pentecost. It's not only for this generation, it's not only for you, but it's also for your children and your children's children and all those who are afar off. And we are that, those people who are afar off. So the things of God, the power of the Spirit is available to those of us today. It did not die out with the apostles. The scriptures are crystal clear that it's available for today. In addition to that, I proved to you last week that tongues, okay, is not of the devil. I mean, it's one of the most absurd arguments that I've ever heard in my life. That something that God gave us is of Satan. And I proved to you out of the scriptures that when you say that something of God and the power of God is attributed to Satan, you are on thin ice because I showed you last week you are approaching the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are crystal clear. You can say what you want to about God the Father, it'll be forgiven you. You can say what you want to about God the Son, it'll be forgiven you. But when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost and attribute the power of Jesus to the power of Satan, you are blaspheming the Holy Ghost and you, my brother, you, my sister, are on thin ice. Do not say that tongues are of the devil. They are not. They are a gift, a wonderful gift from God Almighty. Come on, give him some praise in the house because that's true. Now, in that discussion about tongues, uh, we talked about the laying on of hands. I had no idea that that would be the next thing that we were going to talk about. Because, you know, as I told you last week, I don't go by some liturgical calendar. I go with what the Lord leads in or what I'm inspired by, right? And, and so, lo and behold, I just got inundated with requests and questions and, and, and inquiries to explain what in the world is the laying on of hands. I, and I thought... Surely this can't be, but it be. We, it's, it's odd to me. You got to understand, I was saved in a church that was in full-blown revival, Miss Ann. Full-blown revival. It was a work that had come out of uh, the Brownsville revival in the late 90s. That's when I gave, that's when I gave my heart to Christ was in 1997, 24-year-old man. Saved in a church that was in full-blown revival. They took their worship team and they would go into churches that did not believe in the things of the Spirit. And when we left, they were taking the sign down out front because Pentecost had broke out in the place. And they could no longer advertise them churches as what they wanted to. God had broke out in the place and they were literally taking down the church signs outside the church because Pentecost broke out in their churches. Because of our worship team going in there leading worship and Pentecost breaking out. I'm telling you, Pentecostalism is real. And it's available for today. And you need it. You need it. And so in that discussion last week, we talked about how, is, how do you get that? How do you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Now listen, you can never box God in. Anytime you say, this is the formula... Guess what God's going to do? He's going to prove to you that that's not the formula. But as Christians, we want formulas. 
We want to say, well, this is, the, this is the way church has to be run. This is the way worship has to be done. This is the way the sermons has to be done. We like formulas. It's just in us. God doesn't like formulas. He likes busting out of blocks and buildings. Have you noticed? And he doesn't get in a hurry. How many know Jesus works real, real slow? Have you noticed that? He's not in a hurry. We want things done when? Yesterday. Right? Jesus could care less about timetables. You understand he lives on eternity. Right? He has no, he doesn't wear a wristwatch. Doesn't carry an iPhone that he punches the side button every five seconds to see what time it is. He's on a different level. And so the things about it, Jesus is different. And so I could stand up here and say every time the Holy Spirit is imparted into someone, it's because of the laying on of hands. That would not be true. That would not be true. The Holy Spirit can, listen, He's the Holy Spirit. He can come on you anytime He wants to come on you. There's a brother of mine who pastors in the Assemblies of God who was actually at the time pastoring in the Nazarene church. And for those of you that don't know the Nazarene church, you're talking about formulas. Son, that thing, they got that stuff down to a science. He had reached his end as a pastor. Begin to cry out to God. Guess what? With no preacher nearby, with no one laying hands on him, He woke up out of a dead sleep in the middle of the night praying in the Holy Ghost. You say, well, that's not God. Yes, it is. Because God's God and He can do what He wants to do. He doesn't have to operate in your formulas. And this brother of mine come out of that bed saying, what was that? What did my ears just hear me say? I've preached against this my whole ministerial career, that this was not real, that it's not available today. And lo and behold, here I am in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. He got the baptism of the Holy Ghost because God knew he needed it. (laughs) Now, he showed up on Sunday, probably didn't handle it correctly. Because how many know when you get a boost like that, you're different? Okay, And so if you've ever been to a church that's mainline, and, and again, I'm not knocking mainline. There's people who love the formulas, the methods. I just chafe under things like that. I'm a bit of a rebel. i got to have things like I want it. But he showed up that next Sunday, and of course, if you've ever been to those churches, everything is mapped out. When you stand, when you kneel, when you cough. Everything is, is structured, very much structured. Well, he got that bulletin. I remember paper bulletins. Yep. He got that paper bulletin and he printed it up. And when they opened it up, both inside covers were blank. That's what he passed out on Sunday morning. And, of course, the congregants were confused. Okay. Because there's nothing there telling them what to do. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, just want to let you know this morning that, uh, <laughs> well, We've changed things. I got filled with the Holy Spirit last week, and uh, we're just going to do things differently now. How many they said no? They said, no, we're not going to do things differently. I'm glad you got filled with the Holy Ghost, but around here, we're going to do things the old way. And they gave him the left foot of fellowship, and he come into the assemblies of God, and he's been blessed ever since. And I thank God for that, brother. Right? And I'm sure that church is probably dead now, but hey, if you kick God out, Shut the doors. It's just a matter of time before the thing ends up. And I have, as I said, was saved in a church in full-blown revival. Gave my heart to Jesus, got filled with the Spirit. Pentecost is all I know. This, This is all I know. And so I've never been in mainline denominations. I've never been in a Methodist church other than visiting occasionally or Baptist churches. So I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying what I know. And I back it up with scriptures because I'm a Bible man. And that's got to be the standard for any church. And so I, 
I'm, I'm familiar with what's going on there, but I did not know that there was such a neglect of the things of the scriptures in those some of some of those. And I'm, I'm, listen, hear me now. Receive this, please. I'm begging, in the spirit in which it's been given. I'm, I'm, I don't want you to feel in sense that I'm trying to knock these places, but I am trying to say, look, America is in a bind. The American church is in a bind. And if we're ever going to get out of this bind, we better start getting back to the Bible and living what the Bible says. All of it. All of it. Not just the parts that you can explain easily. I'm talking about the hard parts of the Bible too. I'm talking about the parts of the Bible that make you uncomfortable. You understand, we have got to get back to what the Bible tells us to do. And one of the things that the scriptures tells us to do is that we are supposed to lay hands on people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. Now again, I just shared with you, you can receive the Holy Spirit in other ways. That brother is just one example. Jesus is another to go back to the scriptures. Remember when he was baptized by John the Baptist, right? When he come up out of the water, we believe in immersion. When he come up out of the water, what came down on him? A dove representing the Holy Spirit. And there was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? So have I seen people get baptized and come out completely full and baptized in the Holy Ghost out of a baptismal pool? Yes. There's no one there laying hands on them. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost in the water. If you've never seen that, get on YouTube, watch it. And so, before I get into this, understand that this is not a formula. But the majority of the accounts that we have in the scriptures of people being empowered by the Holy Spirit to either do the work of the ministry or to be a missionary or to do whatever does require there to be an impartation. You have to lay hands on people. Now you say, Pastor John, that sounds pretty spooky to me. Are you saying that when, when there's hands being laid on to someone, that something leaves one person and goes into another? All eyes on me. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. They say, oh, come on, Pastor John, that's hocus pocus stuff. That sounds like something out of some, side of some sort of science fiction movie. No. Science fiction movies got their plots from the Bible. Not the other way around. So listen to me. There's an impartation that takes place of the Holy Ghost from one person to another when there's hands laid on. These are things that should be taught in the church, but are not. And I can prove it. Jenny, go to Hebrews chapter 6 for me, please, ma'am. Now listen, get your nerves all tucked in. Look, this is the scriptures. The Hebrew writer is... Encouraging Christians to make sure they keep it straight. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taking forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and to faith in God. Stop. Do you see that? The Hebrew writer is telling the church, me and you, to stop 
laying the simple foundations. Listen to me. The simple foundations of the gospel are absolutely essential. Without the elementary foundations of the gospel of Christ, you and I are not saved. So I'm not knocking them. But the Bible does call them the elementary teachings of Christ. Why do we have so many Christians in the American church who are an inch deep and a mile wide? I'll tell you why. Because their churches refuse to leave the elementary teachings of faith and repentance. That's all they hear every Sunday morning. That's what they hear. Every Sunday morning they show up, they get the same steady diet. You better get saved. 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 Listen, I got saved 25 years ago, man. Thank God for salvation. I'm going to heaven when I die. I got the inward witness of the Spirit that tells me I'm saved. I got something on the inside of me that cries out, Abba, Father. Okay? But make no mistake about it. The Hebrew writer calls that the elementary teachings of the Lord. I shouldn't have to show up in here every Sunday morning and tell you to repent from dead works. Half of y'all got that. I shouldn't have to show up here every Sunday morning telling you to repent. You should not be coming in here this morning drunk from last night. Likewise, I shouldn't have to show up in here every Sunday morning begging you, pleading with you. To have faith in God. That should be a given. You should know at this point. Okay. That you repent from dead works. And you have faith in God. But again. it's, It's dawning on me. That there are lots of churches. That don't believe in tongues. Don't believe in the gifts of the spirit. Don't believe in the supernatural. Don't do this laying on of hands. Don't take their people into more mature things. How do you know only the mature can handle solid food, the Bible says? So listen, thank God for the elementary teachings. We all need the elementary teachings of God. Without them, we're not in the kingdom. But at some point, you got to move on. So that you can mature. And the Hebrew writer gives us six things here that we should be preaching on on Sunday morning for the more mature in the body. Right? Because again, this is elementary. I like Drexel Elementary. All my kids went to Drexel Elementary. Fine elementary school. Love it. Then they went through heritage. They went through heritage. <laughs> yeah, baby. Still got one at heritage. The other's two's a drone. Right? One's a senior there. She's going to be going off to college. I did that. I went to school, went to elementary, went to middle school, went to high school, dropped out. Because I thought, this place ain't for me. Hallelujah. Said, after about six months of working a dead-end job, that was about stupid. Went back and got a GED. Went to college. Graduated and got a four-year degree, went to Boston and earned a master's degree. I've been growing. My kids are going to grow. Christians should be growing. 
You should be growing. Ain't nobody in here should be hanging out at Drexel. If you're a grown up hanging out at Drexel, I'm calling the law. If you work there, there's an exception. But do you see? So we got churches with no power in them because they don't believe in the supernatural. And they don't move on. All you hear every week is you need to get saved. You need to get saved. I know I need to get saved. Help me. Grow in the Lord. I'm begging. Right? And so I know that a lot of people come in here because they're done with churches that won't grow. And they come in here. And they hear me and they're like, whoa, wait, time out, tongues, what's that? <laughs> Laying on of hands, what is, what's that? And see, and I take it for granted. Because I was saved in a church. Listen, I saw laying on of hands every Sunday and Wednesday before I ever read it in the Bible. We laid hands on everybody. You, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody grew up in a church, you lay hands on everybody. You're like, I stumped my toe. Come here. We need to anoint that with oil. <laughs> everything got prayed for. We're going to lay hands on your foot. Everything. You're going to get all of Jesus. But I guess that's, that's not the way it is. People come in, sing the same song. They sang 1,000 times. Hear the same sermon about getting saved every week and leave and go, yeah, well, I guess that's all there is to it. All eyes on me. No, that's not all there is to it. There's a whole lot in the Bible that we need to grow in. Come on. You cannot plumb the depths of God's knowledge. You're never going to get it all figured out. It's time for Christian people to grow. And look. This is what we need to move into. Instructions about cleaning rites. Now that sounds weird. Almost sounds like that's the law. Where you had to wash pots and pans a certain way. No, that's talking about baptisms. We should be talking to people about the depths of knowledge and the depths of experience and the depths of the Holy Ghost when it comes to getting baptized by immersion in water. Come on somebody. It's life changing. Oh, the laying on of hands. We need to be doing that. That's not elementary teachings of the Lord. No, that's growing in your maturity to Christ. We need to be talking more about the resurrection of the dead. That's coming for those the people who's in the ground. It's a great hope for me and you when we die. We need to be talking more about eternal judgment. Oh, Pastor John, we can't be talking about hell and sin. No one will come. Well, enjoy hell? I don't know, but listen, we need to be talking about there's coming a time where every man and woman is going to stand before the Lord and give an account for what's been done in this life. And that's as real as the nose on your face, brother and sister. That day's coming. We're marching towards something. That right there will never happen again. That's history. What are we marching towards? People say, oh, darkness. Hello, darkness, my old friend. No, we're marching. if you're a believer, hallelujah, you're marching towards the light. It's found in Jesus. So there's all kind of reasons why we need to be laying hands on people. Jenny, go to my next slide for me, please. please. And listen. There's all kinds of reasons. But here's just some of them. When the apostles in Jerusalem, that'd be the big boys. Okay? The leaders of the church. First century. Got to go way back in your mind. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria. Oh, not the Samarians. You're like, well, what's the big deal on that? Do you not understand? That'd be like people from Drexel going, whoa, people in Valdez believed? Are people in Valdez going, whoa, there's no way the word of the Lord went to George Hildebrand. Uh-uh. Is 
When the boys in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John down to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost had not come on any of them yet. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, that being saved is one thing. Again, to go back to Hebrews chapter 6, saved is one thing, okay, great. Being baptized, wonderful. Now let's lay hands on somebody. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Pastor John, I've never seen that verse. I know, that's why I got it here for you. Oh, that's just one time. That's just one time. You're building a whole theology off one verse. Careful, I got receipts. Keep going, Jenny. Acts 19, when Apollos was at Corinth. Oh, you're talking about a wild church in a wild town. Good night. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we ain't even heard there is a, such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked, well, what baptism did you receive? They said, John's baptism. They replied, keep going for me, Jenny. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That's Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, great. Get saved, be baptized, wonderful. Then there's another level. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. It was about 12 men in all. Say right there, Jenny. You see what I'm saying? The laying on of hands. Something going on there. So Pastor John, do we do that on Sunday mornings? Not like we used to. Because I had instinctively, I kind of knew that it's, it's not for public consumption. It's not for people's entertainment. To have hands laid on them in front of everybody so everybody can just stand around and gawk. This may be something needs to be done in maybe a smaller setting. Twelve men. Then I saw a statistic this past week that the larger the assembly of God church, the less the baptism in the spirit. Bigger the crowds, less the number. Smaller the crowds, more the number. Imagine that. It's almost something like Bible where Jesus says, just get everybody out of the room. Let me pray in here privately. We just have a couple of people in here, but we don't need a bunch of people gawking. We don't need a bunch of people just sitting around here watching. What, get all these folks out of here. Let's get down to brass tacks. Let's get down to what we need to do. Next slide. Curry. Thank you. This is a warning for those of us who have been filled with the Holy Ghost, with the laying on of hands. Listen to me, saints, Pentecostals, Charismatics. We're in danger of losing it too. We've got this thing going on. It's one and done. No, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost again. You say, Pastor John, you need, yeah, why? Because we leak, that's why. I can get, listen, don't even, don't even come at me. I know the deal. I can have a great, my grandma told me a long time ago, said, John, boy, listen. He said, she said, when you have a good day in church on Sunday, expect every devil in hell to come after you come Monday. And Daryl, I can act like a pretty good Christian in here. But tomorrow, I got to, listen, you know how many holes I got in my lip, my tongue, when I have to bite it?
Y'all could look at me and say, Pastor John, that's terrible. No, come on. Y'all got the same thing going on in your life. You want to slap people too. And work starts, and we just got the Holy Ghost yesterday. What's going on? Today's Monday, and I'm ready to choke somebody. I'll tell you why. Because you got the Holy Ghost for today. You need some more Holy Ghost for Monday. You got to learn how to pick up your cross daily and follow the Lord. It's an everyday deal. You can't listen. If No wonder you're, you, you, you're, you're all beat up. You ain't got no victory in your life. If you if, listen, come about Thursday. And you ain't, you ain't got with the Lord at all since Sunday. Yeah, you about, you about like where Satan's at. You understand? You got to have something every day. At least I do. I'm in a war inside my members every day. So we in danger of losing it because we think, well, what we got 20 years ago in the Holy Ghost is good for today. Oh, no. You got to get in it every day, baby. Timothy, he was pastor in a church. Paul had to warn him. Don't just sit idly by. For this reason, I remind you, my young son. It was Timothy was his, his spiritual son now. Don't get it twisted. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through what? Ho, 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 bing, ding, 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 through the laying on of hands. So what are you supposed to do? Fan into flame the gifts that are on the inside of you. Well, I ain't got no gifts. Well, then make an appointment to come by here and see us and see the elders. We'll make a small gathering of it. We'll lay hands on you. So something can flame up on the inside of you because you need that. We're out of time. I knew, Mark, me and you talked. You said, he saw my slides this morning. He said, there's no way you're getting through all that. What's next? We lay hands on the sick and pray for them all the time. What's next? I, I got to get to that one. And There you go. Because we got missionaries in the house this morning. Okay? Our good friends are with us this morning who are living in the missionary house. Kevin and Mariah, great folks, great friends. You don't think they've had hands laid on them? You don't think the Apostle Paul? Apostle Paul had hands laid on him? He certainly did. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets. See, there's power in that church. Why? Because they believed in the supernatural. They didn't tell their people that the prophetic gift had died away. No. They had prophets in there. By the way, we got prophets in here. David Scalise is one. Prudy right over there is another one. I trust them. They come up to this platform, they get the microphone. That's them. I'm not saying you because I don't know you yet. No offense, I just don't give the microphone to anybody. But I trust them too in this service. At the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, called Niger. Lucius, of Cyrene. Uh, Manan, Saul. They were all, look, they were all worshiping the Lord and fasting. If you want to know what a church service should look like. In that setting, the Holy Ghost spoke. How did the Holy Ghost speak? Either through a prophet or through tongues and interpretation. And he said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Do you need power for ministry? I certainly do. They do. Then you have elders lay hands on you. It changed my life. 
Calvary Assembly, Greensboro, North Carolina, standing at an altar when I received my ordination and the elders came and laid their hands on me. Changed my life, changed my ministry. There was an impartation that took place into my life. The Holy Ghost left them, went into me. Their gifts went out of them into me. You understand? So the church is missing something when we're not laying hands on folks. Preach all you want about salvation and faith towards God. Good, you need it. It's what gets you in the kingdom. But once you get in the kingdom, have someone like me or the other elders to lay hands on you and watch your life take off. I'm telling you, there's a Bible out there. Come on. and We need to read it and live by it. Somebody give Jesus praise in the house this morning. Well, I trust that was a blessing to you this morning. Stand to your feet. Let me bless you today in the name of the Lord. Ushers are coming this morning. You can bring your gifts to the altar. Do me a favor. If you've got a gift today, hold that envelope up. If you give by your phone, you can hold your phone up. We're just going to pray a blessing over you and this offering. And then I'm going to bless you. We'll be dismissed this morning. Well, hold up that offering. Let me pray over it. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see these hands that have been lifted in this congregation today. And they're bringing their gifts to you as an act of worship and obedience unto you. And so, Father, I pray a blessing over them. Lord, I'm not some prosperity preacher. No, I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. And your word is clear, Father, that you will pour out a blessing on us. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be finances. It might, but it may not be. It may be other areas of our life that we need to be blessed in. So, Father, however you decide in your wisdom to impart blessings on your people, I pray that you will do that for them, Lord God, as they stay faithful and obedient in their giving to you. I pray that over them in the name of Jesus. And now, this wonderful blessing, may it be yours today. May the Lord bless you, and may God keep you. And may the Lord make His face to shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance on you, and may He give you peace. Receive that today in the mighty name of Jesus. I love you in the Lord. Go and do good.